This video is about Toyota's regular sway bar versus the KDSS. How much does the sway bar limit your articulation? Can KDSS provide meaningful off-road improvements? Or is it just another gimmick that's not worth the complexity? Let's find out. Hi, welcome to Tinker's Adventure, I'm Kai. When it comes to 4x4 vehicles, I prefer tried and true systems that provide actual off-road performance. Keep it simple and no gimmicks. The KDSS is Toyota's off-road sway bar solution that involves hydraulic sway bar mounts linked front and rear. Toyota claims this allows running thicker sway bars for better on-road handling, but at the same time, quote-unquote, disconnect them for better off-road articulations. This mechanism is completely different from other true sway bar disconnects such as those on the Rubicon and Bronco. To me, it just felt gimmicky and will get in the way for serious off-road modifications. I've been running no front sway bars for years and never looked back. I did a survey on Instagram to understand the general opinions from the community. 60% voted for non-KDSS and they share similar thoughts like myself. When I borrowed my friend's GX460 to film the Everything About Toyota IFS series, I realized it has the KDSS sway bars. I was actually a little annoyed. Why you have this contraption and make my life harder? But after I test and measure its articulation comparing to a non-KDSS vehicle, I was so surprised that I disassembled the sway bars and conducted more component level testing just to understand its potential. After witnessing the numbers firsthand, I was happy to admit I was wrong about KDSS. I think many people, including myself, never gave KDSS a chance. We just assume it is only marginal improvement and not worth the complexity. So in this video, I will first show you the articulation results of KDSS versus regular sway bars. Then I want to share a critical KDSS drawback for one off-road scenario. At last, I will show you how KDSS interacts with other components and does it limit suspension upgrades. I will also make my personal recommendations as to who should consider or avoid KDSS when buying a new Toyota. All right, let's get started. To make a quantitative comparison, I conducted some corner travel index tests. Compared to the more popular ramp travel index, the CTI exercised the front and rear suspension equally and is independent from the vehicle wheelbase. In my opinion, it is a more realistic simulation of off-road scenarios. First, we have a 2020 5th Gen 4Runner with regular sway bars and bone stock suspension. When the tire broke traction and about to lift off the ground, I measured 3.5 inches of front end articulation and 10.3 inches from the rear. Total articulation is 13.8 and it has a 25 to 75% split between front and rear. In my Everything About Toyota IFS Part 1 video, we measure this IFS is capable of 7.9 inches of suspension travel. Part of this travel is compressing the bump stop, so we should realistically expect a little over 6 inches during slow speed articulation. However, we only got a pity 3.5 inches. I also measured a 3rd gen Tacoma and confirmed the same result. If we look a little closer, within this 3.5 inches, the driver side compressed 1.1 inches and it didn't reach the bump stop. The passenger side drooped 2.4 inches, so it did not reach full droop of the coilover. We are limited by the stiffness of the front sway bar. So even if you get extended travel coilovers that add one inch of droop, you won't be able to realize it in articulation. You will use the extra down travel when both wheels drooping at the same time, but that's a different scenario. The solid rear axles is naturally a lot easier to articulate. Paired with the skinnier rear sway bar, it can usually achieve full compression and droop unlike the IFS. To make things worse, when you're going uphill, which is when you need traction the most, the front end will flex even less due to weight transfer to the rear, creating the common Toyota waves lifting front tires. Running longer rear shocks will improve total articulation, but this will further increase the imbalance front and rear, resulting in more tipping off-road. Now let's see how the stock 2013 GX460 with KDSS did in the same test. The front end flexed 6.3 inches and the rear got 9.1, totaling 15.4 inches of overall articulation. The front articulation increased 2.8 inches, that is 80% more than the Forerunner. If we zoom in on the front end, the driver's side went up 2.5 inches and was compressing the bump stop. The passenger side drooped 3.8 inches which was full droop for factory suspension. Therefore, at least for the IFS, KDSS behaved just like a true sway bar disconnect. The rear suspension interestingly had one inch less articulation than the Forerunner. I'm not sure of the exact limiting factor, but watch to the end of this video 
and you find if a aftermarket suspension is able to change this. One important improvement on the KDSS is that the front and rear articulation is much more balanced. The Forerunner was 25-75% split, while the GX is 41-59. to You can see the body of the GX remain more leveled, which helps with stability off-road. Articulation is important, but there are many other aspects in off-roading. One of them is off-camber stability. I have been through several really sketchy off-camber situations, and I wished I had my front sway bar installed. When I look at Toyota's marketing video for the KDSS, it appears to show if one cylinder is compressed, the other one is forced to extend the same amount. When we attempt to compress or extend both cylinders at the same time, the hydraulic fluid opposes that, hence reducing body roll. By this operating principle, I thought KDSS should have better off-camber stability because off-camber is basically static body roll and KDSS sway bars are extra beefy. That realization got me really excited, so I tested it out. Sadly, the reality was quite the opposite. Driven up these 13 inches tall ramps, the non-KDSS Forerunner leaned 0.6 inch in the front and 1 inch in the rear. The KDSS GX, however, leaned 1.3 inches up front and 1.8 inches in the rear, as if there was no sway bar at all. Out of curiosity, I tested my FJ Cruiser with a rooftop tent on top. It does not have a front sway bar, but it does have a rear one. I expect it to lean a lot more because off-camber felt extra sketchy in my FJ Cruiser. But to add insult to KDSS injury, my FJ leaned 1.5 inches both front and rear. So basically, a stock KDSS GX460 has similar off-camber stability as my sway bar-less lifted FJ with an RTT on top. The GX will probably get worse after a lift. So why did it lean so much and didn't behave like I thought it would? After some research, I found in addition to the front and rear hydraulic cylinders, there are two accumulators between them. The hydraulic path to the accumulators are gated by electronic solenoid valves. The KDSS behave like what's shown in the video only when the solenoid valves are closed. When the solenoid valves are open, the hydraulic fluid can flow in and out of the accumulators, and the front and rear cylinders behave independent to each other, which I verified with testing. At below 12 miles per hour, the solenoids are always open, so the front and rear suspension travel are not forced to be equal, nor we have any body roll resistance. Off-camber stability will be a serious drawback. We saw KDSS definitely improve articulation on stock vehicles, but what about with aftermarket suspensions? Will KDSS become a hindrance? Let's take a look at front and rear suspension separately and with different types of applications. Extended travel is simply the coilovers being about half inch longer. By motion ratio, the wheel has about one inch extra droop. Other components like the control arms are all factory length. In my opinion, all IFS lifts should be extended travel. No good reason not to be. A common knowledge about KDSS is the passenger wheel cannot achieve the extended droop due to the fixed sway bar link. That is true, but only partially. Here, I installed the extended travel shock on the driver's side and connected the KDSS sway bar. The driver's side was able to achieve full droop, but the passenger side was limited to one inch higher. So in this scenario where both wheels droop together, usually in high speed off-road, KDSS has a small limitation on the passenger side. However, as I jack up the driver's side, to simulate an articulation, the sway bar pivots about the fixed link and pushes the passenger side down, achieving the one inch extended droop. This interaction almost feels like how a solid axle articulates. One side goes up, pivoting the other side down. However, if I keep going up, the sway bar starts to twist and bring the passenger side back up again. But at this point, the driver's side is already in the bump stop territory, so you rarely get here during crawling, especially if you have some lift. After I installed the extended travel coilovers set at around 2 inch lift, I verified the articulation each way were pretty much identical and they both reached full droop. I want to note that there are spacers available that drop the passenger side fixed link so that it allowed the extended down travel when both wheels are drooping. However, this will change the interaction during articulation. My guess is the sway bar will pick up the passenger side sooner as the driver's side compresses. I do not have first-hand experience with these spacers, so I do not want to speak with assumptions. I would love to know if you have done similar measurements like mine, but with a spacer. Long travel has longer upper and lower control arms, so the spindle swings in the longer arc of motion. For non-KDSS, 
the front sway bar has to be removed because it attaches to the spindle. Now the spindles are a few inches outwards, it does not reach anymore. I know, many people claim sway bars are overrated and we should remove them and die like real men. But for me, I would love to have my front sway bar back for highway driving. But it also must be disconnectable for articulation. Right now, there is just no such solution for long travel Toyotas. Total Chaos make a sway bar for plus two long travel, but it is not a disconnectable one. However, Total Chaos do make a plus two long travel for KDSS vehicles. Because the KDSS sway bar attaches to the lower control arm, we can retain it for long travel. Granted, its stiffness is reduced because of the longer leverage, but it should still be very effective because it was extra thick to begin with. Compared to extended travel, long travel should have similar angles of all suspension components, so I believe we can expect full articulation from KDSS long travel. When both wheels droop at the same time, the passenger side would now be limited even higher. This might be an issue for high-speed off-road, but the KDSS spacer would probably help. Unlike the IFS, most Toyota rear lift come with more droop just by having longer shocks than factory. No one uses the term rear extended travel, but for the sake of this video, that's how I'll refer to them. For example, this Ironman Phone Cell Pro rear shocks are 2.2 inches longer than factory. You gain around 2 inches extra droop when the axle goes straight up and down. You gain more than that during articulation due to the solid axle geometry. From my measurement, using these shocks, the factory brake lines are already pulled straight but not stretched. The ABS wires are actually under a little tension, but I bend the bracket slightly to relieve it. With these shocks, the KDSS links are already hitting the track bar, and I couldn't reattach the sway bar. After installing the link spacers, I was able to reinstall the sway bar, but it was still extremely close. Ironman's KDSS track bar has two kinks in there to clearance the links. With this, we have pretty good clearance. I retested the articulations on the ramps. The rear articulation increased from 9.1 inches to 11.5. This was a decent improvement. Rear long travel is a marketing term used by several manufacturers. Unlike front long travel, the rear one does not use longer control arms or increase the arc of motion. It is simply really extended travel. The extended length of these shocks are usually 5 to 6 inches longer than factory. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the shock length, just to give you an idea. These suspensions are designed more for rock crawling and less so for high speed. They do give you some really sick rear flex, but also come with many drawbacks, including imbalance with the front suspension. I will not digress further in this video. For KDSS, we will not be able to run this kind of setup. Like many things in life, there is no simple which one is better. There is only which one is more suitable for a given set of needs and trade-offs. For myself, I am not the hardest core wheeler, but I think I like doing more technical trails than 80% of the community. I mainly stick with rock crawling and don't plan to do serious desert racing stuff. I also enjoy driving long distances to explore new places. Just to give you some benchmark of the stuff I like to do, I have driven from Pennsylvania to Moab, Utah. The hardest trial I did at Moab was the trifecta. I was satisfied with how my FJ performed off-road, but I wish it handled better during total 60 hour driving on highway. If I were to get another Toyota for myself, I will without a doubt get KDSS. I will keep it around 2 inch lift, just like my FJ, run KDSS compatible long travel IFS, 35 inch tires, and front and rear lockers. If you want more than this, especially series high-speed stuff with bypass shocks. I'd say starting with the non-KDSS is probably your best bet. After all, Toyota designed the KDSS more geared toward slow articulation and highway driving. The KDSS might actually add some weird dynamics during high-speed off-road. Because some people did report they felt the ride was jarring in high-speed off-road once the solenoid valves closed out the KDSS accumulators. I hope you learned something new about KDSS. Did this video change your impression on this technology? Let me know in the comments below if you would like to get KDSS for your Toyota. If you want to learn more about the construction of Toyota's IFS and its capability, you should check out these two videos. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.